السلام عليكم Uh, we welcome all of you here tonight uh, to this dialogue between Christianity and Islam. First, I have a few announcements. Uh, there can be no uh, recording here at the podium. We, uh, no recorder should be brought up here. Uh, instead, uh, this, re this lecture will be recorded and there are cassettes available and also videotapes available. And if all of you have read this uh, announcement sheet, also available are uh, video cassette of the Jimmy Swaggart Ahmed Didat debate from uh, Baton Rouge, Monday. Uh, also in this sheet, uh, you'll find uh, plenty of space, hopefully, to take notes and to write questions. We're going to uh, welcome written questions and also anyone who would like to come up at the question time after the lecture is completed can come up here to this microphone and and ask any question one question each and they can have it answered uh, and if you have more questions than that you can submit it in uh, written questions to the ushers who will come and collect them after the lecture and inshallah all those questions will be answered uh, to introduce our speaker, Ahmed Didad. Ahmed Didad is the director of the Islamic Propagation Center International of Durban, South Africa. He's a scholar of the Christian Bible who has been engaged for these last 40 years in Christian Muslim dialogue. The purpose of his visit to the United States was to meet uh, Jimmy Swaggart in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where they engaged in a very friendly debate. Uh, his itiner itinerary here in the United States, after Baton Rouge, he went to Tucson, Arizona for a debate, then to Lawrence, Kansas, and after this uh, debate, he, or th this lecture, he'll be going to Kansas City, Missouri. Mr. Didad is the uh, author of many booklets, for example, Christianity in Islam, or Christ, pardon, Jesus Christ in Islam, Is the Bible God's Word, Muhammad in the Bible, and the God that never was. Mr. Didat has attracted a lot of attention, especially from American scholars. He's uh, met in debate uh, such scholars as Professor Simpkins of the Johnson Bible College of Johnson, Tennessee, Dr. Joshua McDowell, Floyd E. Clark, Dr. Anish Sharush, Jimmy Swaggart, and Dr. Robert Douglas. Before the start of this lecture, we're going to have a reading from the Muslim sacred book, the Holy Quran.
dispute not with the people of the book, save in the fairer manner, except for those of them that do wrong, and say, We believe in what has been revealed unto us, and what has been revealed to you. Our God is your God. Our God and your God are one, and to him we have surrendered. Even so, we have revealed to thee the book. Those to whom we are given the book believe in it. And some of these believe in it, and none denies our signs but the unbelievers. Not before didst thou, O Muhammad, recite any book or inscribe it with thy right hand. For then those who follow falsehood would have doubted. Nay, rather it is signs, clear signs, in the breasts of those who have been given knowledge. And none denies our signs but evildoers. Now I'd like to have everyone welcome our speaker, Mr. Ahmed Didat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صدق الله صدق الله نور العظيم Mr. Chairman and brethren the words you heard from my lips were a prayer from the Holy Quran the prayer of the Holy Prophet Moses. I was not trying to hypnotize or mesmerize you in any way. I can assure you that. This was a prayer uttered by the Holy Prophet Moses, according to the Holy Quran, when he was commissioned to go before Pharaoh and ask that his people be freed. Moses' interpretation, he cries to God. Qala, he said, Rabbish Rehli Sadri. He says, O oh my Lord, expand for me my breast, meaning make me brave. Qala Rabbish Rehli Sadri, Wayasirli Amri, and make my task easy for me. Wahlul Ugdatam Millisani, and remove the impediment from my speech. Yafkahu Kauli, that they may understand what I have to say. So I feel that I have more need for such a prayer than Moses. Because in communication there are so many barriers, so many impediments in speech. And one of the greatest of impediments is psychological. You see, when one comes from another world, another philosophy, another ideology, addressing another of a different concept and ideas and background, the prejudice is there. And I pray to God that may he remove these impediments between us in communicating the knowledge about God and his ways. The subject, as has been advertised, is Jesus Christ in Christianity and in Islam. If I were to short-circuit or quicken the explanation with regards to Christianity and Jesus Christ I could quote you from some of the Christian missionary publications the evangelists the preachers you see they always talk about the three lemmas it's a new word I came across in one of your publications Christian missionary publication three lemmas I never heard of the word before but what they're talking about is three L's, three L's. They say Jesus Christ, either he was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Have you heard that before? Either he is a liar, or a lunatic, or Lord. This is the Christian position. The bulk of Christian then they say that he is Lord, that he is God. We will go into the details of the matter, but they put it to others, even to the Muslims, was Jesus a liar? No Muslim can ever say he was because we believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe 
that he was born miraculously, which many modern day Christians do not believe today. And we believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. So we can't say he was a liar. Was he a lunatic? No, we says he was no lunatic. He was the wisest of men. Was he Lord? We question that. You see, the Christian is giving us no alternative. He's trying cornering us. Either we accept this or that. It's black or white. We say, what about in between the two, black and white? There are endless shades of gray. Do you see them at all? I said, look, why can't he be a messiah? Why can't he be a mighty messenger of God? Why must he be a liar, a lunatic, or, or God? Now, what is the Muslim position? Are you at the back, are you all able to hear me? All right? So, the Muslim now, what he says is this, in the Holy Quran, whatever I say, it is backed up by my own holy book. It's not that I'm trying to placate you or trying to carry favor with my non-Muslim brothers and sisters in the audience, that if I say a few good words about Jesus Christ, maybe you in turn might say a few good words about Muhammad. That if I scratch your back, you might scratch my back. No, I assure you, that is not the reasoning behind what I'm telling you now, what I'm going to tell you. The Holy Prophet Jesus is mentioned in the Quran, this holy book of Islam, the Holy Quran, is mentioned in this book by name no less than 25 times. By name. The name Muhammad in this book, supposed to be the book brought about by Muhammad, concocted by Muhammad. The name Muhammad only occurs five times. Four times as Muhammad and one time as Ahmad, an alternative name for Muhammad. Five times. Jesus Christ, five times the number, the name Muhammad occur. Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange? The man who brings the book, his own name is only mentioned five times. And his opponent, his opposition, mentioned 25 times. If there is such a thing as his opponent, his opposition. No. We say there's no opposition. These are, there is a brotherhood of prophethood. And they belong to the same brotherhood. The birth of Jesus Christ is mentioned in this book. The narration about the annunciation and the birth. The name of Muhammad's birth, not leave out his birth, but where he was born is not here. Where he died is not here. His father's name is not there. His mother's name is not there. His wife's name is not there. His daughter's name is not there. Amazing, amazing book this is. Look at this. An, an encyclopedia, 1920 pages. And in this book, the person who's supposed to have written this book, his own place of birth, where he died, no mention. His dear friends, Abu Bakr, not here. Omar, not there. Osman, not there. Ali, not there. Amazing book this is. It's unlike any other book that you have known or you'll ever know. You see, a unique book, unique from every point of view. There is a chapter in this book, and the name of the chapter is Surah Maryam. Surah means chapter, Maryam means Mary, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. In this book, there is no such thing in the Christian Bible. This one I have in my hand here is the authorized King James Version of the book, uh, of the Bible, which has 66 books inside. It's a library or encyclopedia of 66 books into one book form. The Roman Catholics, they have in their Bible, I think I have it here. This is the Roman Catholic version of the Bible. It has 73 books, seven more than the King James Version inside here. But out of the 66 of the Protestants and 73 of the Roman Catholics, there is not a book entitled Mary or Jesus. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and on and on and on, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 
Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, there's no Mary. Here is the chapter in this book called Surah Maryam, chapter Mary. Starting or beginning at the beginning of the birth of Jesus, so in this book, this translation, it has an index. At the end of the book, there's a very comprehensive index. What do you want to know? You want to know something about Jesus. That's the subject of this evening's talk. So you open up J, just like a dictionary, and he said, now let's see what it says about Jesus, about my hero, about my Lord, in inverted commas, about my Lord. So, I'm reading to you from the index, some of the titles under the heading Jesus. Jesus, a righteous prophet, is a true prophet of God, says the book, the Quran. Not my words, this is what the holy book of Islam says. He's a righteous prophet. His birth is described in two places. Chapter 3, verses 45 to 47. Chapter 19, verses 22 to 33. He's apostle to Israel. His disciples, taken up like Adam, not crucified. No more than apostle, not God, not son of God. His message and miracles. He prays for table of viands. He taught no false worship. His disciples declare themselves Muslims. His mission limited. His followers have compassion and mercy. His disciples as God's helpers, as a sign, prophesied Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. These are some of the headings, subtitles, under the topic Jesus. Now, to, let's begin at the beginning, the birth of Jesus. In chapter 3, known as Surah Ali Imran, the family of Imran, Imran comes with the word, the father of Moses. The family of Imran, chapter 3, verse 42, it reads, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَتَحَرَكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ That God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Now, such an honor is not to be found given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, even in the Christian Bible. That Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was a woman chosen above the women of all nations. Ya Maryam Muknuti, li Rabbi ki wasjudi warka imar raqeen. Says, O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly. Prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. Thalika min ambay al-ghaybi nuhihi ilayka. So this is part of the tidings of the things unseen which we reveal unto thee, O Apostle, by inspiration. Where does Muhammad get his knowledge from? About Jesus? He was an illiterate man. A man who didn't know how to read or write. Where did his knowledge come from about what he's speaking? So God Almighty assures him and through him assuring us that this is the revelation of God given to him. His knowledge is from God. The Christian missionary, the evangelist, the preacher, he says, no, Muhammad concocted this book. Muhammad wrote the book. This is his own creation. We say, look, he was illiterate. An ummi. He said, yes, maybe. But you see, even illiterate people, they can be geniuses. Man who has had no formal education, learning. He can be a genius. He can be a great orator. He can be a great thinker. So why could he not have dictated, you know, his own creation? He must have come across other heard about other things, spoken about Jesus and the prophets, and from whatever he heard, he can rehash the whole thing in a far more beautiful language than what he has been hearing. Why could he not have dictated it? We Muslims have to agree that that is a possibility. He could have dictated it. But to prove to you that it was not so, I want you, the audience, to agree with me on just one point. I don't want you to accept him as the veritable messenger of God, the true prophet of God. No, no. It's asking too much. Uh, the only one little request I make from you is to admit that Muhammad was an Arab. That's all. 
Is there any difficulty? Anybody, please tell me if there's a difficulty in you accepting that Muhammad was an Arab. He was not an Indian. He was no Eskimo. He was no Greek or Roman. He was an Arab. Any difficulty? Any difficulty? I want to know from you all. No difficulty. That is all. Thank you very much. Now this Arab, in, now we analyze this Arab, in the first instance is telling other Arabs. If he wrote the book, if he uttered these words, then he's telling other Arabs. He wasn't talking to the Malaysians, Indonesians, Africans. No, he was talking to the other Arabs, his own people. And he's telling the other Arabs that Jesus, I'm sorry, Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was chosen above the women of all nations. Not his own wife, or mother, or daughter, whom we Muslims believe, Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, will be the leader of the women of paradise. That's our belief. But her name is even not mentioned in the book. And he is going out of his way to tell his people that a Jewess, she was chosen above the women of all nations. I'm asking, please account for that. Why would an Arab go out of his way to provoke his own people and go and honor a woman of his a mother of his opposition? If there was such a thing. Telling them that not my wife, not my daughter, not my mother, but Mary, the mother of Jesus. I say account for that. If he wrote the book, why would he do such a silly thing? From the worldly point of view, it's silly. Because to me and to you, to me, my mother, there's no better woman in the world has ever been than my mother. Or my wife or my daughter. Why yours? Why Jimmy Swaggart's? You know, my opponent in a debate on Monday night. Why his? Unless I am forced, I am commanded by a higher source to say that Jimmy Swaggart's mother or his wife Frances is the best woman in the world. In the sight of God, she is the immaculate one. Who would make me to say that? Only God can force me to say that. On my own? Never. My mother, my wife, my daughter. You agree? This man is honoring Mary, the mother of Jesus. The narration continues from chapter 3, now verse 45. It says, وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ So behold, the angel said, O Mary, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُبَشِّرُكِ بِكَلِمَةٍ مِّنْهُ That God Almighty gives you glad tidings, the good news of a word from Him. اِسْمُهُ Masih, His name will be the Messiah. Translated Christ, Ismuhul Masih, who is Abnu Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, Wajihan fit dunya wal akhira, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. Jesus, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. Wa min al muqarrabin, and of the company of those nearest to God. As the Christian would put it, sitting on the right hand of God. We would say, yes, metaphorically. God hasn't got a right hand and a left hand. See, he is a spiritual being. He's not sitting on some chair, glorified chair. What do you say, throne? With somebody sitting on his right side and somebody sitting on his left side and somebody sitting in front of him, somebody sitting behind him. There is no front and back, left and rear. Nothing in the sight of God. So it is, in the sense, we Eastern people, when we say the man on my right hand, meaning my advisor, my prime minister, on my right hand, him could be sitting on my left hand. But he's my right hand man. Is figurative, metaphorical, is not literal. This is that held in, res in respect in this world and in the hereafter. Women and Muqarrabin. Why you kallimun nasa? And he will speak to the people. Who? Jesus. He will speak to the people. Fil mahdi wa kahlan. In childhood and in maturity. Women as salihin. And he shall be of the company of the righteous. When this good news is given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, she responds. She said, She said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? Physically, sexually. The angel gives a reply. She said, Even so, Allah creates what He wills. Whenever He decrees a matter, He merely says to it, Be and it is. For God to create, it's an act of will. Whatever he wants to create, he wills it and the thing comes into being. 
for him to create a Jesus without a human father, just like that. For him to create millions of Jesuses without father and without mother, just like that. But who's going to breastfeed those little Jesuses? You should need the mother. Jesus needed a mother. So God gave her the good news and this is so was Jesus Christ born. This the Muslim believes without any proofs on the outside, without any convincing from the Christians. We believe because we know this mighty messenger of God, Muhammad, had no reason to lie. Why would he tell us all these things? If he had created this religion of Islam, if he had concocted it, surely he must have that imagination that sooner or later my followers will have come into conflict with the Christians. And if there is a conflict, let me give them some strong weapon to deal the Christians with. How to subdue them. And one of the strongest of weapons is ridicule. It's far better than philosophy and psychology and logic and all these things. Far better, far superior to all these weapons, tools, in an argument or a debate is ridicule. Laugh the guy off, man. Laugh him off. Very easy. You come to me with an idea that a Jewish girl 2,000 years ago, she heard some voices and thereon she became pregnant and she gave birth to a child. You want me to believe that? I'm asking you. I said, you know, you have a sister. You know her too well. From childhood you grew together. Maybe you were twins, one boy, one girl. And you are thinking like-minded and you know how immaculate your sister is. She never spoke a lie in her life as far as you know. And this sister of yours, is telling you. He says, you know, brother, you know, I heard some voices. And now, this is the sixth month now. I'm carrying a babe. Now it's going on to ninth month now. A babe. You would believe her? You? He says, no. Then you believe this Jewess? Two thousand years ago she said she heard voices? Naturally not. He said, look, your mother, in the absence of your father, has gone away for many years. She says, you know, she dreamt of your father. And now she's carrying a baby. You know, she's met him in a dream, in the dream. And now she's pregnant and she's carrying a babe. Your mother! I said, you believe her? Would you believe your own mother? You say, no. Then how can you believe this Jewess? 2,000 years ago. I laugh you off. Laugh you to scorn. And there is no better way. Come on, come on. Come forward now. Explain to me how. No, the Muslim can't do that. He, can't, he dare not do that, because if he accepts this book as the book of God, God tells him that so it was. No arguments. We say, Amanna Saddatna. We hear and we affirm. So we are made to affirm that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He was a great miracle worker. And the very first miracle attributed to him in the Holy Quran, is to be found in Surah Maryam, that chapter Mary, in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. Chapter 19, verse 23, it tells us that after the Annunciation, you know, the good news was given to her, and she carried the babe, and when the time for childbirth came, around that time she retired to a remote place in the east, alone, there's no Joseph the carpenter, and the stable, here. In the Quran, there's no Joseph the carpenter and there's no stable here. She retires to a remote place in the east and after the birth of the child, she returns with the babe that the Quran describes. See, at length she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. They said, O Mary, Truly, an amazing thing has thou brought. Shocked, knowing that she comes from a noble priestly family. She was a Levite. And coming from such a noble priestly family, says, Ya Ukta Haruna, O sister of Harun, a descent from Moses and Aaron, they were Levites, and she is also a Levite, Mary, Ya Ukta Haruna, O sister of Harun, Ma kana abu kimra asawim, wa ma kanat ummu ki baghiya. Says, your father was not a man of evil, nor was the mother a woman unchaste. They are insinuating, alleging, how is it that you brought this illegitimate child without a husband? 
What is she to do? Where is her people? In a mood to listen to her, to her reasoning, to her telling you this fairy tale that I heard voices and I'm getting a babe. Were there in a mood to listen to her? Of course not. Would you be, if you were then 2,000 years ago, would you listen to her? Never. What is she to do? The only thing she knew was the child. She knew that this was no ordinary child. So, Fa'asharat ilay, she merely pointed to the babe. In other words, ask him. So they say, Qalu kaifa nukallimu man kana fil mahdi sabiya. Said, how can we talk to one with a child in the cradle? An infant. A suckling. How can we talk to him? And by a miracle, says the Quran, Jesus spoke and defended his mother against an unbelieving audience. So, قَالَ إِنِّي أَبْدُ اللَّهِ So, most certainly I am the servant of Allah. آتَانِيَ kitab. He has given me revelation. وَجَعَلَنِي nabiya, And he has made me a prophet. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُ وَأَوْسَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيَّا وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي وَجَعَلَنِي جَبَّارًا شَقِيًّا He continues. He says, He's made me kind to my mother and not overbearing or miserable. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وُلِدْتُ So peace be on me the day that, that I was born. وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ The day that I die. وَيَوْمَ أُبَسُ حَيَّا And the day that I shall be raised to life again. Such was Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God, says the Holy Quran. So I reaffirm that we believe in Jesus Christ as one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We are going together. We, Muslims and the Christians, are going together. There are 1,200 million Christians in the world today and a thousand million Muslims over two billion people who believe in Jesus and we are going together now comes the parting of the way see I would be a hypocrite if I keep on speaking repeating you know all the other beautiful things that the Quran speaks about Jesus and close the meeting I would be a hypocrite I would be deceiving you. I have to now tell you that there is a parting of the ways between you and me between the Christian and the Muslim and that is, the Muslim is made to say that Jesus Christ is not God. He is not God Almighty in human form. He is not God incarnate, God taking human form. And he is not the begotten Son of God. Metaphorically, we are all the children of God, the good and the bad. We are all his children. But physically, we say God does not beget. Because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. And we are not to attribute such a quality to God. The Christian, in his infatuation, he goes out of his way to say, look, he is the veritable son of God. God begot a son. Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. That is what he says in his catechism. I have read them. The Anglican catechism, the Roman Catholic catechism, the Methodist catechism, the Lutheran catechism in which we are told that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And it goes on, it says, begotten, not made. Don't make a mistake. It's not like Adam. Adam was made by God. Every dog, pig and donkey was made by God. As such, he is the Lord, cherisher, sustainer and evolver of all his creation. He is the father of everything, everybody. But no. Jesus is not like that. He was begotten, not made. And I have been asking Englishmen, English-speaking people. I said, excuse me, please. You see, English is a foreign language to me. I acquired this smattering of what I'm speaking to you now. By speaking, 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 I have become a speaker. So I said, look, please explain to me. When you say in your language, begotten not made what are you trying to emphasize please explain and believe me no Englishman worth the name Englishman has ever opened his mouth to me I only want an explanation what you're trying to tell me when you say begotten not made because begetting is an animal act 
It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. So how can you attribute such a quality to God? I can call one of these young men here, or some older than the young men. You know, I'm about twice the age of most of you. I'm 69. So any young man says, my son, you mind if I call you my son? Would you mind? You object? No. So I call him my son. Maybe he takes a liking to me after the meeting, he comes closer to me, he invites me home for a cup of tea, so I meet my family, and I visit him, and somehow if we are living close by, he visits me, coming and going, he calls me uncle, uncle, or grandpa, grandpa, you know, his father, mother, everybody loves me, respects me, I call him a son, my son, my son. Every time I go to his house, I say, my son, where's the son? My John, my son. So I go one day with some friends, visiting him, I'm asking his mother, where's John, my son? I say, he's just gone to the shop, he's coming just now, so sit down. And he comes. Says, Hello, John. We embrace one another. Hello, John. So my companion, who doesn't know our relationship, is asking me, See, is he re really your son? Maybe a mistress I might have kept, you know, his mother. Is he really your son? I says, no. You see, this young man, he loves me like a father, like a grandfather, and I call him a son, out of endearment. And nobody objects. His father doesn't mind, his mother doesn't mind, nobody minds. I says, no, it is out of love and feeling I have for him, I call him a son. But instead, if I said, yes, he is my begotten son, you know the meaning changes. You understand English? I take it. Yes, he is my begotten son, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That is a bastard. His father is not his father, I am his father. I was responsible for procreating him. I'm swearing him in the most diplomatic language. He's my begotten son. He says, uncle, what did you say? He understands the meaning now. Son, 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 he didn't mind. But now I'm saying, he's my begotten son. He says, uncle, what did you say? I said, no, I don't mean that. And yet I'm telling my companion, Does he, doesn't he look like my Yusuf at home? My Yusuf is in the front. He said, doesn't he look like my Yusuf? He said, yes. What am I saying? I'm putting salt into the wound that he is illegitimate. In a beautiful language. And I have been asking Christians, English-speaking people, I said, when you say begotten, not made, please explain to me what you are really trying to tell me. And I say, no Englishman has ever opened his mouth. It happened to be an American. An American had the guts to tell me what it means. It happened to be in Durban. An American was on a tour of South Africa, and I happened to be a guide to the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere, which is in Durban. And I was guiding him, explaining to him what goes on in the mosque. And during the course of this discussion that was going on, somehow this subject cropped up, and I asked him this question. I said, begotten, not made. What do you mean, begotten? What does it mean? So he said, it means sired by God. That's a term used in animal husbandry. You know, this bull sighed that one, and this horse sighed the other one. This dog, you know, his father was so-and-so, sired by this and sired by that. It is used in animal husbandry. Sired by God. I said, what? He said, no, no, no. I don't mean that. I'm only telling you what it means. And it means exactly that. Sired by God. I said, what are you attributing to God? And animal nature, the lower animal functions of sex, the Muslim takes exception. The language that you're using, maybe you mean well. You are sincere. I'm not doubting your sincerity. But I said, the language is not befitting the majesty of God, that God begot a son. You say, it doesn't mean that. Then I said, why do you say that? Why are you creating unnecessary conflict between the thousand million Muslims and 1,200 million Christians? By using a term which you say, you don't mean it. If you don't mean it, why say it? No, the Westerner has a sickness. You see, I don't know, my words, you know, my language seems at times, you say, look, this guy is too militant. I say sickness. You see, the Englishman, I know them very well. I don't know the Americans too well. This is only my second trip to the United States in 10 years. The Englishman, I'm constantly in touch with him. So the Englishman, you know, when I speak to him, it's what are you trying to mean by what you are saying? You see, he is the closest to me, linguistically. Somehow, let us come to the point. Begotten, not made. Now, this is one of the 
point of real difference between the Muslim and the Christian. In the Holy Quran, we are told about God Almighty. He says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. Walam yakun lahu kufan ahad, and there's nothing like unto him. He does not beget and is not begotten. The Christian scripture, John 3.16. Every Christian with the name preacher, evangelist, Bible thumper, hot gospeler, call them what you like. They can't help using John 3.16. Invariable. If he wants to clinch a client to convert anybody, he must quote John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sacrificed his only begotten son. Muslim says, what are you talking about? What language are you using? Be, beware, be careful. You don't talk about God so loosely. You English-speaking people, you are so particular in the usage of language. If I enter into a contract with any Englishman, he takes me to a lawyer and he ties me up in language. In the contract, he said, I shall do such and such a thing. And there's a dispute and we go to court. So he said, I shall. I thought you will do such and such a thing. He said, no, I said, I shall. I didn't say I will. I can't see the difference between shall and will. But he proves to the judge. He says, look, I said, I shall. I didn't say I will. And I lose the case. He's so particular. He's so good with his language. But when it comes to religion, he talks anyhow. Any language is good enough. Because he says he's in love. Now there's a relationship between him and God. It's not a religion anymore. Christianity is not a religion. A system of codes and laws, ethics and morality. It's a relationship he has established. So he can say anyhow, whatever he feels like, he's infatuated. Anything he can say, anything goes. So, he says, no. You must be more particular, more precise in our usage of language. So this word, begotten, was getting stuck in the Muslim's throat. Because we have been programmed that way. That you don't talk about God like that. Where is it? This is in the Bible, my holy book. So I opened the, I opened the book, the Roman Catholic version is there. I opened the book, the King James version is there. It's there, the word begotten. Now, they have come out, the Christians. They have come out with the RSV, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. RSV. They are claiming that this RSV is going to the most ancient manuscripts. These two here, they go to the ancient manuscripts. Ancient means four to six hundred years after Jesus. Most ancient means two to three hundred years after Jesus. So closer to the source, the more authentic. And they say they have discovered some 24,000 documents, manuscripts. 24,000 manuscripts of these Gospels. 24,000 in Greek. The amazing thing is no two are identical. They don't tell you that. No two, 24,000 they are all varying. No two are identical. And that's a challenge to the scholars as they come forward. Tell me that any two are identical. How did you pick up these Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? No, just by choice. You picked it up like a hot, what's your potluck, potluck. Pot like. You just took this, put the other. Uh, you like this one, you like that one, you like that one. Put it together, you created a book. Out of the 24,000, no two are identical. So, Going to those most ancient manuscripts, your scholars, they've read and reread, and they find that the word begotten is not there. It's not there. In your manuscript, it's not there. So they took it out. They threw it out as a fabrication, as an adulteration. Here, 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 RSV, brought about by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, went to print, pr produce this book. The RSV, Revised Standard Version of the Bible, going to the most ancient manuscripts, the most authentic of all Bibles is this Bible here. They threw it out, the word begotten, as a fabrication. Was it to please the Muslims? Did the Muslims threaten you? He says, you know, if you don't take that word out, you are blaspheming against God. If you don't take that word out, we won't supply you oil anymore. Is that the reason? You know it's not so. No Arabs threatened you. The Muslim world didn't threaten you. You have taken it out, and I say, we Muslims ought to take off our hats to you. Great people, you. Honest people. 
You find a thing is a fabrication, you admit it, fabrication, and expunge it. Great. We had another problem with our Christian brethren. On the Trinity, you say God is one? You say yes. I say we say God is one. You say yes, but you see, you say Allah is the one and only. We believe in a Trinity. He is a triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I say, where do you get that from? He says, it's in my book. I said, where? So he opens the King James Version. He opens the Douay Version of the Roman Catholics and all the other translations based on these two versions. And he opens at a place called First Epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, God Almighty, the Word, standing for Jesus, the Word of God, the Quran says so. It says, Kalima is the Word which God bestowed upon Mary. Word, standing for Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Clearest statement on the Trinity to be found in this encyclopedia called the Bible. Clearest statement. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So I look for it in the Bible, the most modern, up-to-date Bible, brought about by your scholars, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. I see it's not here. What happened? They threw it out without any ceremony, as a fabrication, as an adulteration, to appease us, to appease the Muslims, because we might not supply you oil, or what? Huh? Why did you throw it out? They said, no, it was not in the most ancient manuscripts. This is an interpolation. People fitted it in because they, they wanted it that way. Now, these are not our handiworks. I didn't do the job. By God, I didn't touch the Bible. I touch the Bible now. You know, whatever you tell me, I believe. The Christian, your scholars, whatever you tell me, I believe, I accept. So, begotten is thrown out. Trinity is thrown out. You know, why did you throw it out? You know what? Look, this word Trinity is not to be found in the Bible. The word Trinity is not to be found. You'll never find the word Trinity in the Bible. In any version of the Bible, you have a hundred different versions. In any version, the word Trinity is not there. The foundation of your faith is not there. In any book of the Bible. You use words. Millennium is not there. It's your own creation. Trinity, your own creation. Millennium, your own creation. Rapture, your own creation. Amazing. All these things, your main uh, bedrock of your belief, the terms that you are using are not to be found in any Bible. But you created them. And you use them and you exploit them. The word Trinity, however, is in the Quran. Amazing. You believe in the Trinity and is not in any Bible. You believe in the Trinity, that word is in the Quran. You want to see it? I quote you. If you want to see, get this book. Under T, you'll find Trinity. It'll tell you, chapter so and so, verse so and so. Trinity. But what does it say about Trinity? It says, Wala takulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. Don't believe in such things. Nonsense. salasa. Don't say Trinity. This is stop it, it'll be better for you. Innam wahid. For your God is one God. He's not three in one, he's not one in three. And you heeded the warning. It took a long time. 1,400 years it took you to do that. To realize that this is a fabrication. 1,400 years. This Quran, the Muslims are reading, reciting, telling, Wala takulu salasa, wala takulu salasa. But they didn't deliver the message. But somehow God Almighty has delivered the message to you that this is a fabrication. Throw it out, and you threw it out. I said, we Muslims must take off our hats to you. We must be honest. They have done a great job making your task easy. There are now in Anglican churches, the bishops, more than 50% of all Anglican bishops, they say you do not have to believe that Jesus is God. You don't have to believe. Your salvation doesn't depend on that. So you call them that they are sellouts. Who, the Arabs bought them out? You have, your bishop so cheap. Huh? What, $5,000, 10,000 pounds? You buy out all your bishops to make you to renounce the divinity of Christ? Amazing.
amazing, you people. Such sheep. Your religion, your faith, bishops, they pay servants of the church. No, this is truth. You see, truth will come out. But prejudices die hard. The bishops, they are dragging their feet. I said, you're dragging your feet. Why don't you take a one bold step like Armstrong? You know, when he landed on the moon, you know, this is one step for man and for humanity, something he said, beautiful expression. I said, why don't you take one bold step and get out of this? You see, you have to now start weeding it out and the bulk of the people don't know what you're doing. They don't know what is happening. This book here, 1952, it was first published. RSV, Revised Standard Version. They also threw out the ascension. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, in the four Gospels, only two places ascension mentioned, ascension. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. Luke chapter 24, verse 51. That Jesus ascended into heaven. That Jesus ascended into heaven. Only two places. Now they threw out Mark chapter 16, 9 to 20, thrown out as a fabrication. So out goes your ascension. 8, 9 to 20, the verses are thrown out. Here, here's the book printed by you people here. Printed by the Bible societies. They threw it out as a fabrication. Ascension. From Luke chapter 24, verse 51, is not there. That he ascended to heaven is thrown out. So in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, not one place is the ascension mentioned. The bedrock, the greatest feat of Christendom is Christ going up into heaven, is thrown out as a fabrication. But, you know, some people do play the game. Here, look at this Bible here. It's also RSV. Look at this. This is also RSV. Printed by the same printers. You can see. Same printers. One is a little shinier because it is newer. This is 52. This is 71. So it's, you can see it's a bit shining more. But otherwise, same color, same everything. Page for page inside is also same. Page for page. But you find, when I say, look, it is not in the RSV, Revised Standard Version, Ascension is thrown out. Though the Christians, amazing thing, these scholars, is in your manuscripts, if it is the Word of God, it tells us, Matthew tells us, that Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Mark says, Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Luke says, Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. John says that Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. All four. 100% unanimous that Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. This is God Almighty dictating, inspiring these authors to say, look, my son, in inverted commas, rode the donkey into Jerusalem. 100% Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, donkey, 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 donkey. Amazing. Every Tom, Dick and Harry rode the donkeys into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. But that's news. That is news. But Jesus went up to heaven. is not there in any one of these four books. I see it's taken out as a fabrication. So everything you're fabricating in your religion. What is it? What kind of religion is this? Fabrications? You threw them out? They said, no, I have an RSV and it's there. It's there. I said, where? He said, yeah, where? Look. They put it back again. Yes. Look, here it's taken out. Anybody wants to verify? After the meeting, come to me. I'll show you. Open it for you. Thrown out as a fabrication. Here, back again. Catching fish. Why did you put it back again? Nobody knows. You see, the layman will never know. Because the layman, he opens the book. Whatever it suits him, he starts using. Open the book. It's got what he wants. He uses it. He doesn't read the preface. His scholars do that. Preachers do that. Evangelists do that, but when they get caught out, they won't tell the congregation. The game that, they, that they, the printers, the book, the revisers are playing. They won't tell you that. What games are being played? You know, he's catching fish and the fish is getting caught. Good luck. Carry on. It's big business. It's one of the best businesses in the United States. Start a church. I'm telling you. Sun Myung Moon, I heard him. He's no patch to me. I'm telling you. In speech, there's no question. 
this God, God Swami Pragupada, who started the Hare Krishna movement, no patch to me. In speech, there's no patch to me. You can try them out, listen to them. They're no patch to me. Guru Maharaji, no patch to me. Maharishi, no patch to me. In speech. You know that? But they're all minting millions. They create and they're being worshipped as gods. People worship them in the United States as gods. Father Divine. He must have been a brilliant man. He was an Afro-American or a Negro, what you used to call him then. Right. White people were also worshipping him. The blacks and the whites are worshipping him as God. Anything goes in the United States. Why shouldn't I start a church of my own? You know, I also got the gift of the gab. You agree? And I tell you, I can mint millions. I can also do that. I can tantalize people. You know? <laughs> but no. My religion forbids me. I have no right to do that. I have no right. I have to speak the truth. I said, who are you? I said, look, I'm an ordinary Muslim. What makes you to come and speak like this? He said, look, I've been talking, talking, and I've talked myself into this. See? That's all. Now I've become a talker by talking, talking, talking. No other credit. I don't hear voices by God. I don't hear any voices. I don't hear God coming and telling me like some of these guys are claiming. So God comes to me and tells me, he says, son, son, again and again, son, here are beta. My son, is that how God talks to you? I said, what language does he speak to you? I haven't had the chance of asking. What language? He says, son. He didn't call his own son Jesus. Son, he speaks in the third person. At the baptism, if you remember, in the scriptures. So when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the river Jordan, a voice was heard saying, a voice was heard from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He's not talking to Jesus, that you're my son and I'm well pleased with you. No, no, no. He's telling the other people that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He never spoke to Jesus' son, but now to every Tom, Dick and Harry, God is now direct communication. He says, son, so what about this? You know, I have a problem, daddy. But he said, look, I cannot tell you. No, no, he's, in the writings, I cannot tell you. Why can't he tell you? Doesn't he know the answer, this God of yours? Or is it that you are inept? Something wrong with you? Why doesn't he tell you? He said, I cannot tell you. What do you mean he cannot tell you? No, that is the relationship. They have established a relationship with God. He says, no. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, ascension throne. But now they put it back. So you read the preface. In the preface they tell us that individuals and two church denominations out of the 50, individuals, Bible thumpers, hot gospelers, preachers, evangelists, they, individuals and two church denominations, they protested that this thing should be put back. Otherwise, we will tell the people, don't buy this RSV. It is too dangerous. These scholars have done damage to our cause, our faith, our belief. So, therefore, says the revisers in the preface, they say that these, the longer ending of Mark 9 to 20 and Luke chapter 24 verse 51 are now restored to the text. Why? Not because God told them so. This is my book. You have no right to explain anything from my book. You have done it. Put it back. And I said, put you into hell. And hell is no joke, says Brother Jimmy Swagger. No joke. And it is no joke. Games, 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 for money's sake. In the meantime, these revisers, they made a net profit of $15 million on the RSV. $15 million. Before they got caught out by these preachers. Before they could stampede them to restore. $15 million. Big business. The world's best seller. Of course it is the world's best seller. The Bible. Good money. Big money. So, these are the pictures of Jesus. The Christian belief is that he is God Almighty. In human form. He is God incarnate. The Muslim says, no, God does not incarnate. He doesn't say, no, Jesus is not God incarnate, but Muhammad is. Jesus is not the begotten Son of God, but Muhammad is. That Jesus didn't die for people's sins, but Muhammad died. Nothing of the kind. This is a Hindu idea that God becoming a man. My ancestors, I'm an Indian. Not a red Indian, brown Indian from India. <laughs> Otherwise, we must put into the reserves. They said, Look, we've got a reservation for you. <laughs> so I don't want any reservation. I come from the East, really East. My ancestors were Hindus. I'm a new. 
Muslim from the point of view that two to four hundred years ago my ancestors became Muslim. But before becoming Muslims, we were worshipping Rama as the seventh incarnation of God. We worshipped Krishna as the eighth incarnation of God. We worshipped Buddha as the ninth incarnation of God. And we believed in endless incarnations. Because my ancestors, very clever people, very clever people, they reasoned. And the reasoning was very good. They said that God Almighty, He's so pure, He's so holy, He's absolute holiness, like a holy robo. What does the holy robo know how I feel when I see a beautiful young thing, even at the age of 69? What does he know how I feel? Does he feel the way I feel? Probably not. Then what right has he to tell me, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife? What does he know what is to covet? So to be qualified, says, said my ancestors, that God Almighty comes down to earth to experience this life, to know what he's talking about. His Holiness, the Pope. You know, His Holiness, the Pope, made his pronouncement on the pill, birth control. You know that they are not to use pills, birth control, but you must use the natural cycle, you know, fertile period, infertile period. That is valid, not the pill. So when he made that pronouncement, some cynic remarked that the guy who doesn't play the game, what right has he to lay down the rules? Does the Pope play the games we play? Does he? Does he? No. So what right has he to tell us about fertile and infertile period? What does he know how I feel when my need arises? Similarly, my Hindu ancestors reasoned. They said, look, God Almighty, you know, to be qualified, he must come down to earth. And the same God comes, keep, keeps on coming into the world again and again. It's the same God. There's only one God. Rama is that God. The same God came as Krishna. The same came as Buddha. The same came as Kalanka Uttar. The same came as Mahatma Gandhi and on and on. They are prepared to believe in endless incarnations. No, that's the logic is good. The Christian, he will reject this idea. He says, before Jesus, God did not incarnate. After Jesus, he will not incarnate. He is the only incarnation. Only time that God came into the world, he came as Jesus Christ. Not before, not after. The Muslim says that God does not incarnate at all. He doesn't become man. What he does is, he chooses a man from among men, one of us, flesh and blood in all respects. But that person is so finely attuned, he's so sincere to God, that whatever God commands him on a higher spiritual level, what we call revelation. They are like the electromagnetic waves of the spiritual world. God Almighty communicates with them on that level, and they in turn reproduce those messages on our level, sound wave, 600 miles an hour. We call such people prophets of God. They are the mouthpiece of God. They are speaking the words of God, but they are not gods. Similarly, we say, that is Jesus, Moses, David, Solomon, Muhammad. They are all the mouthpieces of God. As such, we say, love them, respect them, revere them, follow them, but worship none of them. Worship the one and only God that there is, the Father in heaven. He is the only God. Call him Allah. Call him Jehovah. Call him what you like. As long as the term that you use is not contaminated. That's all. Use any name for him, says the Quran. Call him Rahman, call him Rahim, call him by any name. But we say, as long as that name is not contaminated. For example, if I were to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that the name of God Almighty in Islam is Muhammad. As soon as I say Muhammad, you think of an Arab, a camel driver. No? Yes. If I say the name of God Almighty is Krishna, you think of an Aryan in India, a Hindu. As soon as you say his name is Jesus Christ, you think of a Jew born in the stable to a Jewish girl called Mary, circumcised on the eighth day. That's a picture. So any name that conjures up a mental picture of the divinity, God Almighty, is taboo. Don't use such words for God, but call him by any name as long as the name is not contaminated. And that name is not Jesus. He's not Muhammad, he's not Rama, he's not Krishna. Call him Allah, call him Jehovah, call him whatever else you will. But don't use these terms for God. So this is the point of real difference between the Muslim and the Christian. The Christian says he's God, he's either a liar, a lunatic or Lord. I say he's neither a liar, nor, the, nor a lunatic, nor the Lord. He is what he claimed. He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to guide you people, to guide us, to guide his people. 
from formalism, from ceremonialism into righteousness. The whole truth. He came to give them the truth. He showed them the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is for his people. If you want another way, God will not accept it. In the time of Moses, the Jews chose another way through the golden calf. As a result of that, God said, kill the people. The Jews, the Bani Israel, they were told, kill one another. And they killed 24,000 Jews for worshipping the golden calf. He said, I don't want it. They didn't say the calf is God. They said, we want to worship God through it. He said, I don't want it. I want you to come to me direct. He said, I am your Lord and I am a jealous God. I shall have no other gods before me. Not even of the likeness of the things on earth or in the heavens above or in the waters beneath the sea. For my name is jealous and I am a jealous God. I want nothing. He said, no, I want it this way. He said, I don't want it. I was listening to a program. I will end with this. I know I have taken so much of your time. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions to ask. So I will give you that opportunity. But I, I end with this example. A living example from America. I was in my hotel room. I can't remember the town because every night they're taking me to a new town and a new bed. And I just can't seem to remember. Baton Rouge I remember. And then, yes, Tucson I remember, but I don't know where. I put on the TV set in my bedroom in the hotel. And I see Brother Jimmy Swaggart. He's preaching about Babylon. Beautifully done, you know, very well. He's got a small team of experts around him. His wife, uh, Frances, is also there. Because something happened and he asked something and she responded. So when I saw her, this is on TV. At the, towards the end of this program, just a couple of days back, one of the experts on the panel of that program, he says, you know, I've been to Mongolia. Mongolia. You know, around Tibet, that side. Mongolia. And there I visited a Buddhist temple. And I saw the prayer wheel. The wheel. You know, on which, you know, they offer their prayers. So people come along with the request, with the prayers written on it. What do they want? You know, I want to get married. I can't get a wife. So look, mm -hmm, I want asking Buddha to provide me with a wife. He said, look, I want, I'm in difficulties. I want some money. So I want $5,000, you know, to build a new house. So I make a request, I put it on. And when the wheel is turned, they believe that it is, the prayer is being transmitted. You see, this is very, very scientific. You know, look, you transmit messages by pressing buttons that they do by turning of the wheel. So, they're asking him, he says, what are you doing this, turning the wheel? He said, no, no, no. We are sending out messages to Buddha to hear our prayer. So, Jimmy Swaggart's panel expert, he's telling the, uh, the, the, the guide, he says, but you know, he said, I have read a lot of books on Buddhism, and Buddha never claimed anywhere he's God. He thought he stumped the man. Nowhere does Buddha say I'm God. In none of these books that he ever made such a claim that he is God. He said, yes, but he said, we make him God. We, we make him God. He didn't say he's God, but we make him God. I said, right. You know, what a message, what a message by God, what a message. Jesus didn't say I'm God. He didn't say worship me. Nowhere. He says, come, I'll teach you how to pray. Pray like this. Oh, our Father, which art in heaven, yours and mine, including Judas, the traitor, he's the father of everybody. O oh, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where is the Father of Jesus Christ in heaven? Where is he? I am God. Where is he? I am equal to God. On the contrary, he says, he says, I, my Father is greater than I. My Father is greater than all. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said, the word ye hear are not mine, but the Father that sent me. He had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the Father has said unto me, so I speak. He says, I by the finger of God cast out devils. I by the Spirit of God do these things. He said, all power is given unto me. It's not mine. It's given to me. He says, of that day knoweth no man. No, not the angels, nor the Son, but the Father in heaven. In my knowledge, I'm not like God. In my power, I'm not like God. Everything is given to me by God. Glory be to Him. 
When he performed a miracle, somebody truly remarked in the Gospels, he said, glory to God for giving such powers unto men. That is true tribute. That is the word of truth. Glory to God for giving such powers unto men. Not to the man, to God. So this is the Muslim case. This is the Muslim understanding of the teachings of Jesus as he sees it in the Bible and he sees it in the Quran. With these words, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very grateful to this society here for creating such an opportunity for me to come to you and share with you my thoughts on the subject of Jesus Christ in Christianity and in Islam. Wa dawan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. may come down to this microphone and ask questions. Those who would prefer to write their question or who have a lot of questions can submit it. They can raise their hand and submit it to the ushers. And also, if you need a pencil, the ushers have pencils for you. So we welcome all questions, please. This mic here is too close. You should be somewhere there. Okay, uh, now we'll begin with the, with the oral questions, please. Oh, sir, you claim that Jesus never said he was God, but uh, have you read John 8:58? I'm sure you're familiar with that, where he took the name of God that was described in, uh, to Moses. When God said to Moses the name that he wanted to be called forever in generations, he said, I am who I am. Jesus in John 8, 58, when asked, you know, who he was, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And then right after that, the Jews, the Pharisees, took up stones to stone him because he committed a blasphemy, claiming to be God Almighty. How do you answer that, sir? Uh, shall I repeat my words? I said, nowhere did Jesus ever say, I am God. Nowhere did he say, worship me. That's English. I don't know whether the Americans understand the English the way I understand. I said, he said, no way did he say, I am God. No way did he say, worship me. Now, you quote me a verse. He didn't say, I am God, did he? He said, I am. He didn't say, I am God. I'm, let's, let's, the English, the language that I'm using. I hope we are, you remember at the beginning I offered a prayer. You know, remove the impediment from my speech psychological barriers. You see, I'm thinking something, talking something, you're understanding something else. I said, where he said, I am God. Where he says, worship me, nothing. So you're quoting something else. I will respond. You see, I will not brush you off. I say, oh, this is of no consequence. No. He did say, they're asking him, he says, in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. You see, they come looking for Jesus. And he's asking, whom seekers? Thou, you people, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus. He says, I am he. I am he. Who? God. They were looking for God. No, he says, I am he. Who? Jesus, the one you're looking for. If some of your FBI or CIA fellow comes along looking for D-Dad, he says, who is D-Dad here? I said, I am. What, God? When I say, I am? No, he says, I am D-Dad. So now, if a person is looking for trouble, you see, when we're looking for false, and the Jews were looking for trouble against Jesus, any excuse, every excuse, slightest something he says, they pick up stone, stone again to stone him. Why? Because they say, you claim such and such a thing. You blaspheme, you blaspheme. They were always continuously out to get him out, to catch him out, because they didn't like his preaching. Okay, they say, where are you, Jesus? Okay, Jesus is in the garden. Now, is it normal for a person to say, before Abraham was, I am? Right. So, no, 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 right. That, that's right. 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 So, that's right. So now, this word, I am, is from the Old Testament. You see. No, 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 no. Moses goes to the mount. Yes, sir. And when he's commissioned to go and liberate his people, he says, he's asking God, he said, look, what shall I say? Who sent you? So he said, look, I am what I am. Eheye, asher, eheye. 
in Hebrew. That's what he said. Ehye, asher ehye. Means I am whatever I am. He you know, says, don't bother about who sent you. I sent you. Go, man. What you asking me names? I am? Not I am whatever I am. Please, 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 please. You see, the questioner, I hope, will go and sit down. Because this is not a debate. You ask a question, I will answer. Please sit down. Please sit down. Let it in the front seat. There's a chair. Sit down there. That's it. You ask the question, I will respond. You see? But this is a debate. And debate I had with Jimmy Swagat. You see? We don't want to debate tonight. So, God tells Moses, go man, go. Eheye ashar eheye. I am what I am. What you bothered about who I am? Somebody comes along and says, look, move the mic from here to there. He says, who are you? Maybe he's in charge of this establishment. Say, look, don't bother about all that. You put that thing there. What? He says, who are you? I say, I am whatever I am. Do the job then. So that word in the Greek translation is ho on. Ho on, I am. In Greek, your Septuagint, you know, your Greek scriptures of the Old Testament, the word there is ho on, means I am. In the New Testament, the Greek word is ego eimi. It's not the same word. Whatever it means in Hebrew or Greek, I don't know. But it's not the same word. Ho on, ego eimi. Then before Abraham was, I am. I am before Abraham was. I am. I said, now how was he? Was he with God? I accept he was with God. See, he was with God. I say, you were also with God. I was also there. Jeremiah tells us, God tells Jeremiah, he says, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I made you a prophet to the nations before you went into your mother's womb. Jeremiah, you read that? Jeremiah, God says, I know you before you were in your mother's womb. I made you a prophet. How? What kind of a prophet is this? Before he goes in his mother's womb, he's a prophet. Was he with God? Of course he was with God. In other words, in the knowledge of God. Jeremiah was there. Jesus was there. Muhammad was there. Hitler was there. Regan was there. Everybody was there. You, me, everybody. In the knowledge of God. He knew long before, you know, the creation of Adam and Eve, that there will be a night. This guy, Ahmad did that. You know, he'll go and lecture. And you, my son, I don't know your name, but he said, you will come along and you'll be the first questioner. He knew all that. In his knowledge but you were not there in this form i was not there in this form jesus was not there in that form in the knowledge everything was there that is the all-knowing god long beforehand he knows everything you see so in that sense jesus was there with god before abraham was born in this world before historically chronologically abraham came on earth jesus was there in his knowledge in his plan he had jesus there he had muhammad there he had hitler there he had regan there can you see? Before Abraham was born, Regan was there, Didat was there, everybody was there. How? What form? Shape, size? No, no form, no shape, no size. Knowledge. His, his self-knowledge. He's omniscient. Do you say that? God Almighty is omniscient. He's all-knowing. If he's all-knowing, he knows. Everything, before and after. It is to us, before, now and after. In the sight of God, there is no before, now and after. It's all shh. An open book. That is our understanding of the expression. Why the Jews took exception? They were taking exception to everything. You see in John, chapter 10, verse 30. You remember? They took up stones again to stone him. You know why? Because he said, I and my father are one. You read that context and you find it's a series of deliberate misunderstanding. See, when you're looking for trouble, you get it around the corner. You don't have to go very far. This is human beings. Every innocent expression you make, I can find fault with it. You know that? Like the word son is my son. So what do you mean? You knew my mother? I said, no, no, son, I don't mean that. I said, you still call me a son? You know, you can bash me on the jaw. It has happened to me. See, in my country, it is a country, you know, full of color separation, apartheid. I'm traveling in a bus, Pullman bus. I don't know if you have things like that here. From the north coast where I got married and I'm coming to Durban, you know, where I live and I work. After a weekend, I am returning. I'm sitting in the bus. And while this bus is passing now through Durban, the city where I live, 
and I can see that it's going to the central station, but it passes uh, Alice Street where I work. So I walk up to the driver and I ask him, excuse me brother, does this bus stop anywhere near Alice Street? If so, then I can pull the string and nearer to, to get to work instead of going to the station and then walking back two miles. If it is stopping anywhere near Alice Street, it's passing Alice Street, I know it's crossing it. So he said, no. Not like he barked, he said, no. I thought maybe sometimes, you know, we do speak with jerks, unintentionally. You know, I speak a bit too loud when I didn't mean it. You see? He said, no. So I go and sit back on my chair, seat. So it takes me to the central station. No alternative. By hydraulics, the doors are opened. I get down, I'm still holding the rail, one leg on the ground, and the leg is the other one on the, still on the, on the, on the platform. So he leaves his steering and he rushes to me. He says, don't you call me your brother. He says, call those coolies your brothers. So what happened? I'm stunned. I don't know what's going on. He says, don't you call me your brother. Call those coolies your brothers. I'm counted as a coolie. Coolie means a laborer. You see, some of my people, they had gone to South Africa as laborers. So they divide the people into Africans. They call them Kaffirs. Coloreds. Coloreds are a mixture between black and white. They call them hot knots, hot and tots, bushmen. See? Me, I'm a coolie, whether Hindu, Muslim or Christian. So he says, don't you call me your brother, call those coolies your brothers. But I don't know what happened. You know, it's so sudden, I didn't mean anything. You know what he thought? He thought that I insinuated that my father had something to do with his mother. Is that what I mean when I say my brother, my son? No, he took it that way. And I'm stunned, if he had a gun, he would have shot me. By God, fortunately he didn't have one. So this is, if you're looking for trouble, innocent expression. He was a, a, a brother, I, I said, you still call me up my brother? You know, he could have punched me, you know that? So, mom is the word, retreat, honorable retreat, I did. However, the next question. Thank you. I pray for you, sir. Before you allow me, I'm going to go ahead and ask you three or two quick questions. Uh, one, we ask you yeah, one, one question at a time, please. And we will take the written questions afterwards, so you can ask as many questions as you want. My question is that we as Muslims, we believe that the word of God came through and God revealed it to Jesus Christ. Where is the original Bible? What happened to that original Bible, which is the original word of God that was revealed to Jesus? You see, the Gospels, the Gospels do speak about Jesus preaching the gospel. The gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you will read in them expressions like these, and Jesus went to a certain place and he preached the gospel. Ma Ma Mark says, Jesus went to a certain other place and he preached the gospel. Luke says, he went to a certain other place and he preached the gospel. Luke says, uh, John says that he went to a certain place and he preached the gospel. Gospel, 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 gospel. Now, we believe in that gospel. The word translated gospel into Arabic is Injil. We believe in the Injil. That there was this revelation God Almighty gave to Jesus. What he preached was from God. No doubt about that. But I'm asking my Christian learned brothers, I said, look, when he preached the gospel, did he have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians under his arm? A book? No, he didn't have any book with him. There was no Matthew, book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, nothing was there. So what did he preach? What he preached was the gospel. His message was the gospel. What you have now in these books here are called the gospel according to Saint Matthew. The Gospel according to St. Mark. The Gospel according to St. Luke. The Gospel according to St. John. According, 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 according. I'm asking why according to? I write little booklets. Yeah, here's one. Crucifixion or Crucifixion by Ahmad Didat. Is the Bible God's word? Ahmad Didat. Is not according to Ahmad Didat. This is not according to Ahmad Didat. This is Ahmad Didat. You read G Brother Jimmy Swaggart's books. It's by Jimmy Swaggart. By Jimmy Swaggart. It's not according to Jimmy Swaggart. Why according to Matthew? 
According to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. Why according, 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 according? You know why? Because none of them sign their names. They are anonymous books. This is what you assume that Matthew wrote. This is what you assume Mark wrote. This is what you assume Luke wrote. This is what you assume that John wrote. Therefore, according, 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 according. Now, this translations into Arabic. You have the Arabic Bible printed by the Christians, by the Bible societies. And they name their books in Arabic. It says, Injile Matthew. In the Injil or the Gospel of Matthew. Injil. Injile Matthew. Injile Marcus. Injile Lucas. Injile Johanna. I said, we believe in the Injile Isa. Isa means Jesus. We believe in the Injil, the Gospel of Jesus. Have you got Injile Isa? Bring it. We will... We will approve it. We will accept it. If there is such a thing, there isn't. Jesus Christ never wrote a word in his life. He never asked anybody to write a word in his life. Not a word was written in his life. Not one word was written in his lifetime. Where is the book? So we believe. Some, you asked the question? No. So we believe in the principle that God inspired Jesus. Whatever he said was true. There are some of his words still preserved in the Bible. Like for example, and this is life eternal, Jesus says, that they should know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Do Muslims accept that? Of course. That there is only one true God. It's a la ilaha illallah. In the time of Jesus and Isa Rasulullah. Jesus the messenger of God. We believe. You see? But now, you said that is what the message, the whole message that he brought is not here. Matthew even didn't write Matthew. Matthew, you see, J.B. Phillips, a prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral in England, a paid servant of the Anglican Church, he translates the Gospels into modern English. You can buy his book, I don't know whether you can buy it in America, it's common all over the other English world. The Gospels in modern English by J.B. Phillips. J.B. Phillips, in his preface to the Gospel of Matthew, he says, early tradition ascribed this Gospel to the Apostle Matthew. That's what people said. But scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. What? Muslim scholars? Jewish scholars? Hindu scholars? No. Christian scholars. They reject the view that Matthew wrote Matthew. The author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew, for example, I said Matthew 9, 9, instead of saying the first book of the New Testament, chapter 9, verse 9. Matthew 5, 17, instead of saying the first book of the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 17. Conveniently, I must use the word Matthew instead of wasting your time and my time. So the author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew, has plainly drawn on the mysterious Q in inverted commas, which stands for the German word quella, sources, mysterious sources. He says, which may have been uh, an oral tradition. He has used Mark's gospel freely. In the language of the school teacher, he was copying wholesale from Mark. Matthew and Luke have copied 85% ad verbatim from Mark. And Mark was a 10-year-old boy when he, Jesus walked this earth. He was a 10-year-old boy, a schoolboy. Imagine an eyewitness and a ear witness, a disciple of Jesus. He call, goes and copies a boy 10-year-old who wasn't there. Does it make sense to you? He's copying ad verbatim, word for word. Luke and Matthew, 85% copied word for word from Mark. And Mark was not there. This is, this, this is the status of the book. I hope I've answered the question. Okay, uh, we'll have these two questions, and then I would like to read a few of the written questions, and then uh, if there are more uh, people who would like to come down, they're welcome to come down. Both well, common to the Jewish belief and the Christian belief is that the life that we know when we die, we will be resurrected, and there's what we call salvation. The Jews believe that the salvation is based upon their obedience to the law. Christians believe it's based upon belief in Jesus as Christ. What is the basis for the Muslim belief in salvation? Uh, if what you said is correct, that the Christian belief is in believing Jesus as the Christ, we have the salvation. Because we believe that Jesus is the Christ. We believe that. But no, I think you fail to say that you believe that he died for your sins. That he paid the price. So your salvation is got through the blood of Christ. That he paid the supreme sacrifice with his life. I think that is what you had in mind. Now, that's 
topic, the subject, while I was reading the index, if you remember, I said, Christ Jesus not crucified is another topic. I've had debates with Christian you know, evangelists, Americans, evangelists on this topic, like a Floyd, Professor Floyd E. Clark from Johnson Bible College. I had a debate with him in, uh, uh, in, in, in the Royal Albert Hall, London, last year. I had another Professor Simpkins, you know, also an American. He came to South Africa. We debated with him. Was Christ crucified as well as is Jesus God? How about the crucifixion? So we say Jesus Christ was not killed, nor was he crucified. This was a subject of debate last night with Dr. Robert Douglas of the Zwemer Institute. He's the director of the Zwemer Institute, a missionary organization in this country. I had a debate with him last night. And I think the tape as well as the videotapes are available. You can, you can avail yourself of those. How does the Muslim get salvation? You see, to Muslim there's only one way. And the way is for all eternity the same. There is no change. God is not the author of confusion. He wouldn't tell Moses something and he gives something contradictory to Jesus and again something to contradict him to Muhammad. If it is all coming from the same source, the message must be the same. His law is eternal and it is not changeable. He doesn't change his laws by the minutes. He fails one system, then he introduces another system. That is not my God. He doesn't fail with his systems. He gave to Moses and to the children of Israel a law. The law was that as you sow, so you will reap. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, we are given that in a nutshell, which is truly Islamic. It says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the Christian puts a full stop. All his literature, his evangelical literature, he stops there, puts a full stop where there's no full stop. He says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Father Adam, he sinned. We, his children, are not responsible for what he did. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. His sons today, in Los Angeles, last June, this previous June, 300,000 sodomites, whom you call gays, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. Here in San Francisco in your country, God Almighty will not ask Adam and say, Hey, look at your children, this rubbish. What have you produced? No, God will not ask him. He is not responsible. He says, The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Whatever good thing the good man does, he gets his reward. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Whatever the evil monger does, sinner does, he gets his punishment. Salvation. How do you get salvation? It continues. The verse continues. But if the wicked will turn, means repent, from all the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Spiritually. Physically we all die. The good and the bad. The sinner and the saint. We all die. But this die means spiritually you will not be destroyed. You will live forever. That is salvation. You repent of your evil, do that which is lawful and right, Whatever God told you to do, you do. Heaven is for you. Solomon the wise, he tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, advising his son and through him advising us. He says, and further, by this my son be admonished. Learn a lesson from this. Of making many books, there is no end. All your excuses for not doing the job, not doing the work, not obeying God. There's no end to your excuses. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. You know, you say, I'm going to study Buddhism, I'm going to study Taoism, I'm going to study Judaism, I'm going to study Islamism, and I will come to a conclusion. He says, you'll get tired. He says, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter in a nutshell. Let's get the message. He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's all. Fear God and keep his commandments. That is salvation. Jesus Christ told you the same. He says, very, verily I say unto you, most certainly I'm telling you this, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. Except it exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
He said again, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, most certainly I am telling you, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Tittle, jot, jot is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Not even that amount is to go out of the law of God. He said, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I said, we teach and we do. I ask you, do you keep the laws and the commandments? You say, no. I said, why not? He says, the law is nailed to the cross. Why not? He said, we are living under grace. That's what the Christian says. You're living under grace. I said, where did you get this? This idea that the law is nailed to the cross is done away with. Where did you get it? So he quotes me. Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians, Colossians. And so who's this? Who's this? Timothy, Romans. Who's all this? What's this? Who is that? It's a Paul, 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 Paul. I said, who is your master? You say, Jesus. What does he say? You're contradicting Jesus. And Jesus said, the disciple is not greater than the master. Master is Jesus. What he tells you, I say, I listen to my master, Jesus. He never had the pig. He, none of his disciples ever touched that pork. You call it pork, ham, bacon, whatever you call it. He never touched that stuff. None of his disciples ever touched it. And you are all pig eaters. Christians. Where did you get this? He said, Peter had a dream. On that dream, now you eat pigs. When my master never had it. He wouldn't eat it. It was abhorrent to him. He killed 2,000 pigs. One hit. He destroyed them all. You know that? But now you don't listen to him. You are now living in the grace. I said, are you circumcised? He says, no. I said, why aren't you? Well, it's a major commandment. God gave. Your Lord was Christ. Jesus Christ was circumcised. I said, what is good for your God should be good for you. No, you won't circumcise. Why won't you? This is the law of God. He entered into between Abraham and his descendants forever. And you claim to be spiritual descendants. How does that absolve you? It is Jesus was circumcised and you are not. He said, no. He says, Paul said, circumcision, circumcision is nothing and non-circumcision is nothing. I said, Jesus says, not even one jot or one tittle is to pass from the law. Can't you see? You are not following Jesus. You are following Paul. 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 He is the real founder of Christianity. Paul. Not Jesus. Therefore, your great countryman, Michael H. Hart, he wrote a book on the top hundred, the greatest hundred in history, the most influential hundred people from Adam to current time. And he gives us a list. The hundred, the top hundred, or the greatest hundred in history. Michael H. Hart, New York, of the Hart Publishing Company. And in that list of the most influential men, after giving the list of hundred names, he puts them in the order of seniority. Number one, number five, number fifty, number ninety-nine, who, who, who? And he puts Muhammad number one. The most influential man in history, according to Michael H. Hart, an American, in America, publishing a book of 572 pages, retailing about 10 years ago for $15, which I paid for it. Maybe it cost 50 today. I don't know. He says, Muhammad is the most influential man in history. And his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, number three. His God and Savior, number three. And he gives reasons. Not because some Arab bribed him. So here's 10,000 for you. Say a good word about Muhammad. Put him number one. We we'll give you 100,000. Put him number one in your book. No. No Arabs could ever think of that. It's possible but not probable for an Arab to do that. Why does he put Jesus Christ as God and Savior number three? He said, you see, the honor for Christianity is to be shared between Paul and Jesus. Actually, Paul is the real founder of Christianity. This is it. So follow Jesus, listen to him, you can't help being a Muslim. You'll be a Muslim through and through. But you don't want to listen to Jesus. Read the books. Listen to the sermons. It's Paul, 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 not Jesus. What did Jesus say? He says, He is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. But the cowards that we are, we are not prepared to pick up the cross. First of all, thanks very much for coming tonight. Um, I understand from other teachings that I've heard about Islam that 
most of the Islam people would agree with certain things in the Bible, they would agree with what is in the Quran. Okay. Um, in the Christian teaching, it says that Jesus, according to the Gospels, as, as you've already talked about, did in fact die on the cross and was the payment for all of our sins, which through him is the way for us to be able to have his righteousness and therefore be perfect in God's sight. I was curious as to the view in the Quran as to the crucifixion, if indeed it did or did not happen. With regards to the crucifixion, the Quran is very explicit. Very explicit. It says, وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَ بْنُ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ That they said in boast that we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. In answer to that, God says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ That they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ But it was made to appear to them so. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَقْتٍ مِّنْهُمْ And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمِ They have no certain knowledge. إِلَّا تِبَا الزَّنْ They only follow conjecture, guesswork. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا For a surety, they killed him not. That's the Muslim position. We say, Amanna Sadakna. We hear and we affirm. But now, my sister says, look, we have a record. The Christian says, we have a written record. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, these 27 books of the New Testament. And we have hundreds of prophecies fulfilling this event. My response is, I said, look, my brothers and sisters, you are reading this book, the Bible, in your own mother tongue. And I'm claiming that you are understanding the exact opposite of what you're reading. Not just misunderstanding. We can have a lot of misunderstanding. But exact opposite. If you read in the Bible, for example, that thou shalt not commit adultery, you are understanding that thou shalt commit adultery. So how can we be such zombies? What do you take us for? You know, we are the people who live on the moon. You know, we got the whole world in, a, in the palm of our hand. You have the Bay of Bengal tragedy. See, America warned Pakistan. They said, look, the tidal waves are coming. Be on guard. They didn't hit the warning, the fools, my people. They didn't hit the warning. And hundreds of thousands more people died. They warned the Jews in 1973 that the Arabs are on the move. They didn't hit the warning. So we know the Arabs. Every time they want to do anything, they make a big noise beforehand. So when we will do this and we will do that. And by then, he said, we'll give it to them. So they didn't hit the warning. First time the Arabs caught the Jews off guard. They broke the bar left line. First time they took the initiative. Because they didn't hit the American warning. You got the whole world in the palm of your hand. And yet this same nation, he's reading the book in his own mother tongue and he's understanding the exact opposite of what you're reading. This is not just a charge, an allegation. I prove it to you in two minutes. I said, you know, Jesus returned to that upper room after his alleged crucifixion where they had the last supper. Those of you who know your Bible, you know what I'm talking about. He goes in and he wishes his disciples in the Hebrew language, Shalom Aleichum which means same as Salaam Alaikum in Arabic, peace be unto you. And when he said peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. So I'm asking why were they terrified? Because when you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, the Arab and the Jew, we embrace one another, we kiss one another. I felt very funny the first time the Arabs did it to me. But I'm getting used to it now. You see, I said that's what the Jews did 2,000 years ago and the Arabs did 2,000 years ago. Instead of doing that, they're terrified. I said, why were they terrified? So the man knows his Bible. He said, look, Luke chapter 24, verse 36. He tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. Is that the answer? Yes, that's what the Bible says. Luke says, they thought he was a spirit. So I said, did he look like a spirit? And by now, for 40 years I'm talking, not one Christian has ever told me yes. If he did, if you do, I said, what does a spirit look like? If he says he looked like a spirit, I said, what does a spirit look like? Tell me now. No. Everybody says, no, he didn't. So I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one? Puzzled. Puzzled. So I said, you see, the reason is that the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay people talking that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay people were talking that he had given up the ghost. You know, the spirit had come out, he had died. They had heard from hearsay that now he's dead and buried for three days. All the knowledge was from hearsay, people talking. Because they were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses to the happening. Because Mark chapter 14, verse 50, he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples forsook him and fled. All. 
I said, does all mean all in your language, you English man? He said, yes, that they were not there. All the knowledge was from hearsay. On hearsay knowledge, if you heard about a man, your master, who's dead and buried for three days, you expect him to be stinking in his grave. Such a person, when you see, naturally you're terrified. You think he's a ghost, a spook, spirit. So Jesus wants to assure them that they're not what they're thinking. So he says, Unzuru ila yadayya wa He says, behold my hands and my feet. Inni ana huwa, that it is I myself. Husuni wanzuru, say, handle me and see. Fa inna ruha laysa lahu lahmun wizamun. For a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. Handle me and see. A spirit, a spirit has no flesh and bones. A spirit, mean any spirit, is an indefinite article. In your language, any spirit. And this is an axiomatic truth. You don't have to prove it to the atheist, the agnostic, the Hindu, the Jew, the Muslim. Universally, we say spirit has no flesh and bones. If you get got flesh and bones, you're not a spirit. No convincing required. Why does he go out of his way to tell them so? Because they're thinking that he is. So he said, the spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have and they felt him and they believed not for joy meaning that they were overjoyed and wondered what happened man we thought the man was dead and buried to assure them further that they are wrong in their understanding he said Ainakum hahuna ta'am have you got here anything to eat fanawaluhu juz'am min samakin wa shay'in min shahadi asalin fa akhaza wa akala kuddamahum and they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb and he took it and he ate in the very sight to prove what there is a ghost that is spook his spirit is resurrected no and the same fellow man damn fools what are you afraid of me for handle me and see and look at the post crucifixion events he is ever in disguise ever in disguise his own disciples can't recognize him on the way to Emmaus ever in disguise he never went to the temple of Jerusalem he never went and showed them said, look here I am he gave a sign to the Jews the sign of Jonah that I will be like Jonah and I'm reasoning with the people. What was the sign of Jonah? Look, it's another topic. I dealt with it last night with Professor Douglas. Get the videotape and I deal with this more extensively. Or get this book absolutely free. Crucifixion or crucifixion. Sounds the same, but it is not. Have a look. Crucifixion, the first fiction is F-I-X-I-O-N. To fix up a person on the cross and kill him. That's crucifixion. The second is cruci, F-I-C-T-I-O-N, fiction means a fairy tale. And the Quran says, Illa tiba zan, the only following conjecture, guesswork, fiction. And I prove it to you from the Bible. I give 30 different reasons from the Bible that Jesus Christ was neither killed nor crucified. You must be big enough, men enough to read it, women enough to read it, and then come back to me. And I tell you in your own language, as if somebody has made zombies out of you. You read something and you're understanding something else. You read there again and again. Acts chapter 1 verse 3. He says, and he gave many convincing proofs, Jesus, many convincing proofs that he was alive, A-L-I-V-E, alive. That's the word there. He was alive. Mary Magdalene, after her experience with Jesus, she returns and tells the others that he is alive, A-L-I-V, alive, and they believe not. The two from Emmaus return to that upper room telling the others that he is alive, and they believe not. These eight or ten telling Thomas he wasn't there at the first meeting. He said, look, Jesus is alive. And he believed not. By God, I don't know what you're reading. In English, A-L-I-V-E, alive. A-L-I-V-E, alive. Not resurrect, not resurrected, not res alive, 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 alive. And you say resurrected, resurrected, resurrected. You concoct a word which is not there and then you thumbsuck it. And then you want the whole world to thumbsuck it as well. I said, there's something wrong. Somebody has made zombies out of you in your own mother tongue. Come, talk to me. Bring your, 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 your Jerry Falwells and your Pat Robertsons and uh, who else is there? Billy Graham and uh, Jimmy Swaggart. Bring them, arrange four meetings in the United States on topics like is the Bible God's word? Was Christ crucified? Is Jesus God? And I am prepared to pay any one of these $10,000 per performance, just one hour. In Madison Square Garden, I give you 10000 and I will organize the meeting. We need four meetings like that in the United States. Let the country know, these 240 million people, that look, you are being led by the nose by somebody. And that somebody is not God. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of the questions, the written questions. 
the first question or actually a lot of comments comes from Father William Carr who says thank you for pointing out many things that I teach in my class what Catholics believe he says to be brief we do not believe that the English Bible or any other translation is inspired by God but only the original in the original languages uh, and then he goes on to say that thank you for showing that the church comes before the Bible and that the teaching of Trinity was taught by the church and then that interpretation was put into first John and I guess the question is uh, I guess he wants your comments on this uh, idea uh, it's not a comment it's cause for another lecture you see so many things so many points have been raised if you start dealing with that you won't be able to touch anything else therefore you see this was a more manly approach you say, look this is my question what have you to say is the church now is the church is telling you what to believe so you have a preconceived notion long before you start now this is what the church says so you read into the book what is not there Jesus said seeing they see not hearing they hear not neither do they understand this is it the situation you're already programmed to see certain things you are reading into the book something that is not there the only ways you come out with it is a look he said I am what what do you say now he said I and my father are one what do you say to that he said I am the way the truth what do you say to that that is a better way then you write a, your small thesis and now I have to answer that it calls for another lecture and I think at this age it is a bit too much for me please forgive me for that The next question, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't read all of the questions. It says, do you have a spirit? And then it says, uh, are you, do you have a soul? And please explain this. And does your spirit lead you or does God lead you? Does he communicate with you or does the Quran tell you uh, what to say and what to do? In a, in a nutshell, the Quran tells me what I should say and what I should do. We believe in spirit, that, otherwise I wouldn't be here. There is a soul or spirit call it what you call like there is something in man which is immaterial which is intangible we believe in that and that somebody that something is the real you he is the driver of the motor car this vehicle and that somebody will be made responsible for every act that you do and we believe in a life hereafter where you will have to account for your deeds we say life hereafter we believe in heaven and hell there is heaven and there is hell and exactly as Jimmy Swaggart says he says hell is no joke the Quran gives us 41 different references hell is no joke hell is no joke hell is no joke perhaps he has been reading the Quran and he's like, done a beautiful job beautiful lecture I haven't heard a Muslim lecture so so potently on the subject of heaven hell is no joke but you have a look at this in the Quran under the subject hell in the index check them up and you'll see that really what he, Billy Graham, what Jimmy Sagat said, is insipid compared to what God Almighty is telling you here. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions with the same idea which say, uh, what happened to your debate with the Pope? No, I had no debate with the Pope. No debate. Uh, what did happen is that uh, His Holiness, the Pope, you see, when he went to Turkey, he made a pronouncement that we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Kenya, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Nigeria, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. Now, who is this we? We. We. This is the Roman Catholic Church. They want to have a dialogue with the Muslims. Actually, he didn't mean that. I knew it all along. It's not a dialogue that he wants to come and talk to us. No. He's telling his people, go and convert the Muslims. If he uses the word convert, the Muslim reacts strongly. So if the man comes along with his dog collar, you know, collar turned upside down, knocks at the door, he knows now what is he come for, to steal our children. So get rid of him somehow, man. Get rid of him. But if he says, let us have a dialogue, the Muslim can't say no, because the Quran says to have a dialogue with him. The Quran says, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala, come. Ahlul Kitab, people of the book, meaning Jews and Christians, Ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum, that we come to common terms as between us and you. 
and the terms of getting together, the Quran lays down. It says, Allah na'buda illa Allah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shay'an, and that we associate no partners with him. Wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah. And that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah, other than God. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ فَكُلُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ But if they turn back, tell them that we are Muslims. We have submitted our wills to the will of God. Whatever God wants us to do, we are prepared to do. That is what the Quran says, come, let us have a dialogue. His Holiness says, let us have a dialogue. But he doesn't mean a dialogue. So I write a letter to him. To His Holiness, with all respect, I say, Your Holiness, these are your pronouncements. And the Quran tells us also to have a dialogue. We would like to have a dialogue with you. In St. Peter's in Rome. Any day, time, you tell us, I will come over. No reply. So, I send another letter. No reply. Then I send a telegram. No reply. I send another telegram. So I get the response that he is prepared to receive me in the secretariat, in private. So I said, no, this is not a matter between Ahmad Didat and His Holiness, the Pope. It's a matter between Islam and Christianity. There are 1,000 million Muslims on the one side, 1,200 million Christians on the other side. The whole world wants to know what you're talking about. It's not a cup of tea that I have with the Pope, and he embraces me and wants to kiss my hand. And then he wants to kiss my feet, so I stop him from doing that. So I come and tell you, he says, you know, I went there in His Holiness, you know, he embraced me, he kissed my hand, and he wanted to kiss my feet, I didn't allow him to do that. And I, I shared with him, you know, he shared with me some tea and biscuits, and he gave me this Bible, you know, guilt-edged. What does it mean? To me it's worthless, rubbish, trash. The world must know what you are talking about. The Quran tells us to have a dialogue with him. So, I am asking him, how big is your secretariat? Because there are three plane loads of youth from my country, Durban, Johannesburg and Cape Town. They want to charter planes. My brethren in the Middle East, they want to charter planes. My brethren in the UK, they want to come along to the meeting. And the whole world wants to know. The, the TV networks of the world would want to cover it. The news media of the world would want to cover it. How big is your secretariat? No reply. Another one. How big is your secretariat? No reply. Telegram, no reply. Then somebody, this somebody, God Almighty, you see, he activates people. He does things in mysterious ways. He sends me, is the, the pamphlet here? We had it in the box in the van. The pamphlets about the Pope. You didn't bring it inside? Where? Exit. Uh, so, uh, there it is. Let me have it, please, quickly. Just pass that on. Thank you. The Chinese have a saying, one picture is worth 10,000 words. If I told you, he said, you see, somebody sent me a picture of His Holiness. Doing like this. You say, what are you talking about? Now you're making a mockery of His Holiness. I said, no, here is the picture. It's a picture. Genuine picture. Look what His Holiness is doing. Look. He's playing hide and seek. Look at it. As if from heaven, the Archangel Gabriel, the Holy Ghost, couldn't have delivered a better message to me than to tell me, said, look, the man is playing hide and seek with the Muslim. So I take this out. He's playing hide and seek. If you think of a better caption, you tell me, I give you a reward. I lost a bet with Jimmy Swaggart the other night. I lost a bet with him, you see, uh, uh, but I won the debate. That's what I claim. I lost a bet. I lost a hundred dollars with him. I bet, you know, and I lost. But here I said, look, I'm prepared to give you. Give me a better caption, and I give you a hundred dollars. A better caption than this, for this picture. Give me a better caption. You Americans are very good at giving captions. Give it to me. So, he's actually playing hide and seek with the Muslims. He doesn't mean a debate. He's telling his people to go and convert them. And in that dialogue, we will come out second best. Because my people are not trained. These are all trained men. So he said, let us talk in public. We have differences. We say, Jesus is not God. He say, he is. Let's talk about it. Let the world know. And let them judge for themselves where truth lies. We are big enough today. Not like in the good old days, pull out, pulling out a dagger. I disagree with you, so I'm going to put a knife through you. You disagree with me, you're going to put a knife through me. No, we are so big. Look at us. I'm speaking the most sensitive subjects from the time I arrived in the United States on the 31st of October. Most sensitive topics. And nobody has shouted me down. Nobody has caught me, as a matter of fact, in all my life. No Christian or Jew has held me like this. Nobody. And yet I'm talking the most sensitive topics. Either I'm a superman, you know, angelic, or 
that you people are so tolerant and good and kind. You are prepared to give me a hearing, though it's going against your grain. He says, look, I agree to disagree with you. And I salute you for that. You give me that opportunity to talk to you. So the, His Holiness, it was not a debate, it was a suggestion for a dialogue, and he didn't want to respond because he didn't really mean it. I apologize that there's not a lot of time left. May we have time for just one more question? Okay, we can have the last two then, okay? Thank you. Well, you have said that Jesus didn't write any of his, uh, you know, that the Apostles were who wrote these things, right? In the Gospel, in the Gospel, you have said that Jesus did not write the Gospel or, uh, or he didn't even tell the, the Apostles to write. That's correct. That Jesus Christ never wrote a word. He didn't instruct anybody to write a word, and not a word was written in his lifetime. Okay, but what do you say about the, the book of Revelation, where, where he appears to St. John, or John, and he told him to write, uh, he appeared to him? I said, in his lifetime. You know, that's English. Lifetime means while he walked this earth. If somebody sees a dream, if somebody sees a dream, call it vision, a dream, is not walking in his, I said, in his lifetime, before his cruci alleged crucifixion. Did he tell anybody to write a word? Did he? Did he tell Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Did he commission anybody? Was a word written in his lifetime? A word? No. You see, you read the internal evidence that shows that Matthew even write Matthew. You know, Matthew 9, 9. You know what it says? No, it's not a matter of belief, my son. It's a matter of fact. The fact is, look, in his lifetime, that means while the man walked this earth, not he didn't ask anybody, nor did anybody write a word. That's a long and short of it. Now, afterwards, somebody sees a dream. Did Matthew see a dream? Did Luke see a dream? No. Luke tells you why he wrote. You know, he tells you. Why did he write? He said, you know, he sees a lot of people have written a lot of things concerning the faith that we are preaching. So, it's having had perfect understanding from the very first, it seemed good to me also. These other guys, less educated than I, if they can write books, if they can write volumes, why can't I? I'm a physician, I can do a better job, I can do things more systematically. So he says, listen to the words, the, your language. He said, it seemed good to me also. Revelation is a book of dreams. You know, you read there, after a man has eaten too much, when you eat too much, you know, you have hello, that type of things that goes through your mind. He sees a beast with seven horns, and every horn with a hundred eyes, with the eyes outside and the eyes inside. Who sees dreams like that? Man, you know, when he's eaten too much of protein. I appreciate you being here too, and I, we got your late, so I haven't gotten all of it. But uh, I, was, I would like to ask too, you, not tripping as rudely as what you had some of the other people, please. You, it takes you 20 minutes to answer a question. Please allow me one minute to ask it, okay? And my question is uh, you've attacked my country, uh, my faith, uh, but uh, I'm going to finish. Uh, would I, and, and to me, what you're doing tonight is I happen to be a pilot, and you're taking the wheel of that airplane, bringing it up here on the table and saying, this is Christianity, let's see if it will ever fly. And you can attack that wheel, you can look at the bearings, you can look at the, the struts, the shocks, and tell me that it will never fly. And you're pulling pieces out of Christianity and telling me that Christianity will never fly. When I know in my heart, and that's the testimony that I have for you tonight, that Jesus Christ is very real. He's a very real person. He's real to me. I wonder what, what Muhammad is to you. The question that I have, I guess, is that you are privileged enough because the United States of America is a Christian country, sir, to have this forum tonight, would I have the same type of a forum in your country that's been Islam? That's the question. Thank you. You see, amen. I'm really grateful for this opportunity, and I do take off my hat to the American nation for giving me this freedom, this latitude to A, my point of view, you allow Father Divine to propagate his faith and people were worshipping him. Sun Myung Moon, Guru Maharaj, Maharaj, Maharishi, and the whole lot. People who worship Satan in your country. Now when I say 
you have a Satan worshipping cult. Now you say, now you construe that as an attack on your country. Am I attacking your country? I said, look, this is a fact. Those 300,000 sodomites that gathered in San Francisco, I'm not attacking your religion, I'm not attacking your nation. I said, look, there is a sickness here. Jimmy Swaggart, you allow him to tell you that there are 11 million drunkards in America. If I said that, you say you're attacking my nation. He says there are 44 million heavy drinkers in your nation put together and he says I make no distinction between the two. That makes 55 million drunkards according to Jimmy Swaggart. He's not attacking. He's not. He says incest, he writes a book on incest, has reached epidemic proportions in your country. No, he's not attacking your country. He's not attacking your religion. He says about the preachers, a book on preachers. He says the preachers, I go to a bank. He says in his book on the preacher. He goes to the bank and the manager wants to know from him he says, whether he knows who are the worst payers. So Jimmy Swaggart, in humility, he says, no, I don't. He says, there are P three P's. Three P's, you know, P, letter P, three P's. So what are they? He says, preacher, painter, and prostitute. These three P's, the worst payers. And Jimmy Swaggart says, he says, look, I don't know about the painters and the prostitutes, but I know about preachers. The man is speaking the truth. Am I attacking your nation, your religion, your country? What am I doing? When the same incest, academic, Sodom and Gomorrah, homosexuality, he says what it has done, he's saying in his book on homosexuality, you know, this filthy, dirty thing you call gays, sodomites, you call them gays. He says, America, he says, it's time that God would judge you. If he doesn't judge you, he says, he might have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. What is it? Attacking your religion? Is he your enemy? Jimmy Swaggart is your enemy? Now, if he is, I am also your enemy. I am telling you the very same thing. I said, look, these are sicknesses you have in your nation. And I am prepared to help you. I want to help you. If, if such a person as I can help you. He is giving beautiful answers, beautiful books he has written on homosexuality, its cause and its cure. Beautiful work. And he quotes two and a half pages from the book of Romans, two and a half, first page, whole page quotation. Continuation, second page quotation, third one, half quotation. And in that the answer is given. The answer to your problem is given. Why you have these lesbians and why you have these gays. It's given in that quotation. But you read the whole book. I'm not taking swag out now. I love him by God. I tell you, I love him and his wife. Fantastic people. I met them personally. They invited me for lunch. Unfortunately, I couldn't take advantage of it. Great man. His wife, great woman. Born again Christians. He writes the whole book. But the cause that God gives you, if it is the word of God, he doesn't reproduce it at all. The cause. He says it's cause and it's cure. I give you the cause. What he missed out. You read the book and you'll see he missed out. I don't know how. An Englishman, English speaking person, American. How he missed out. Cause, it's cause. It says, that quotation of his, it says, professing themselves to be wise. That's what man does. Everybody who is taking you astray, he thinks he's very clever. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like that of the corruptible man. And who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship the creature and, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who be glorified forever and ever. For this cause I made your women to go after women and your men to go after men. For this cause you change the glory of the almighty God, the eternal immortal God into that of an image of a man. Image of a man is telling you of a man, perishable man. Whether it is a Moses or a Jesus or a Muhammad. Whether it is a Rama or a Krishna or a Buddha. Image of a man. But when Paul was writing that, he wasn't thinking about Jesus. He was thinking about the Romans and the Greeks. They had their man gods beyond counting. You remember? Jupiter, the god of heaven. Pluto, the god of hell. Vulcan, the god of fire. Neptune, the god of the sea. Mars, the god of war. And Zeus was the father of all these gods with his many wives and many children. He was sitting on some planet. And from there he was sending his sons into the world. His Apollo, his Horus, his Isis, his Osiris. Among such a people goes an idea of a new son of God, Jesus. So what was metaphorical to the Jew became little to the Greek and they started worshipping Christ. Image of a perishable man. 
Wasn't he like a man? Circumcised on the eighth day, eating food, hungering, thirsting, weary, sleepy. That's what the Bible describes him. Man, man, man. You worship him as God. You do that? He said, for this cause. That is the cause. You mean to say he didn't understand that English? For this cause I make you to do this. As a punishment for worshiping man, you bring down the Almighty to this level, you go down to that gutter level. I met him. My brother, I forgive me. This is my way of talking. You see, this is my nature. Uh, I'm not the one who's been through the university corridors, you know, to go and find out all these fineies of talking. I haven't. I'm a layman, a furniture salesman. I'm now starting to talk religion. So if I sound hard and strong, this is something that I can't help. But I, by, by God, I don't want to attack the American nation nor his religion. And I think you asked a question at the end about salvation, I think. Oh, yes. yes, you can do the same thing in my country. My country gives you total freedom. In my country, I enjoy a freedom second to none in the world. Here, this book here, Crucifixion of Crucifixion. It went through the fire of hell twice and it came out unscathed. The censorship board. I don't want to belabor you all, but my country, I have a freedom of religion which is second to none in the world. Yeah. This is what I'm doing. Uh, thank you much, Brother Didat, and thank ladies and gentlemen for the wonderful reception. Uh, Brother Didat has come from a very long distance to talk to you, and we appreciate the wonderful reception you have given him. Thank you very much.